21. The next day, Monday, Todd was up at six o'clock in the morning and poking listlessly at a scrambled egg he had fixed for himself when his father came down, still dressed in his monogrammed bathrobe and slippers. Hmm, he said to Todd, going past him to the refrigerator for orange juice. Todd grunted back without looking up from his book, one of the 87th Squad Mysteries. He had been lucky enough to land a summer job with a landscaping outfit that operated out of Pasadena. That would have been much too far to commute ordinarily, even if one of his parents had been willing to loan him a car for the summer, neither was. But his father was working on site not far from there, and he was able to drop Todd off at a bus stop on his way and pick him up at the same place on his way back. Todd was less than wild about the arrangement. He didn't like riding home from work with his father, and he absolutely detested riding to work with him in the morning. It was in the mornings that he felt the most naked, and the wall between what he was and what he might be seemed the thinnest. It was worse after a night of bad dreams. But even if no dreams had come in the night, it was bad. One morning he realized with a fright so suddenly it was almost terror that he had been seriously considering reaching across his father's briefcase, grabbing the wheel of the Porsche and sending them corkscrewing into the two express lanes, cutting a swath of destruction through the morning commuters. You want another egg, Toto? No, thanks, Dad. Dick Bowden ate them fried. How could anyone stand to eat a fried egg? On the grill of the Gen Air for two minutes, then over easy. What you got on your plate at the end looked like a giant dead eye with a cataract over it. An eye that would bleed orange when you poked it with your fork. He pushed his scrambled egg away. It barely touched it. Outside, the morning paper slapped the step. His father finished cooking, turned off the grill, and came to the table. Not hungry this morning, Taro? You call me that one more time and I'm going to stick my knife right up your fucking nose, daddo. Uh, not much appetite, I guess. Dick grinned affectionately at his son. There was still a tiny dab of shaving cream on the boy's right ear. Betty Trask stole your appetite, that's my guess. Yeah, maybe that's it. He offered a wan smile that vanished as soon as his father went down the stairs from the breakfast nook to get the paper. Would it wake you up if I told you what a cunt she is, daddo? How about if I said, Oh, by the way, did you know your good friend Ray Trask's daughter is one of the biggest sluts in Santa Donato? She'd kiss her own twat if she was double-jointed, daddo. That's how much she thinks of it. Just a stinking little slut. Two lines of coke and she's yours for the night. And if you don't happen to have any coke, she's still yours for the night. She'd fuck a dog if she couldn't get a man. Think dad'd wake you up, daddo? Get you a flying start on the day? He pushed the thoughts back away viciously, knowing they wouldn't stay gone. His father came back with the paper. Todd glimpsed the headline. Space shuttle won't fly, expert says. Dick sat down. Betty's a fine-looking girl, he said. She reminds me of your mother when I first met her. Is that so? Pretty, young, fresh. Dick Bowden's eyes had gone vague. Now they came back, focusing almost anxiously on his son. Not that your mother isn't still a fine-looking woman. But at that age, a girl has a certain glow, I guess you'd say. It's there for a while, then it's gone. He shrugged and opened the paper. C'est la vie, I guess. She's a bitch in heat. Maybe that's what makes her glow. You're uh, treating her right, aren't you, Tato? His father was making his usual rapid trip through the paper toward the sports pages. Not getting too fresh? Everything's cool, Dad. If he doesn't stop pretty soon, I'll, I'll do something. Scream, throw his coffee in his face, something. Ray thinks you're a fine boy, Dick said absently. He had at last reached the sports. He became absorbed. There was blessed silence at the breakfast table. Betty Trask had been all over him the very first time they went out. He had taken her to the local lover's lane after the movie because he knew it would be expected of him. They could swap spits for half an hour or so and have all the right things to tell their respective friends the next day. She could roll her eyes and tell how she had fought off his advances. Boys were so tiresome, really, and she never fucked on the first date. She wasn't that kind of girl. Her friends would agree, and then all of them would troop into the girls' room and do whatever it was they did in there, put on fresh makeup, smoke Tampax, whatever. And for a guy, well, you had to make out. You had to get at least to second base and try for third, because there were reputations and reputations. Todd couldn't have cared less about having a stud reputation. He only wanted a reputation for being normal. 
And if you didn't at least try, word got around. People started to wonder if you were all right. So he took them up on Jane's Hill, kissed them, felt their tits, went a little further than that if they would allow it. And that was it. The girl would stop him, he would put up a little good-natured argument and then take her home. No worries about what might be said in the girls' room the next day. No worries that anyone was going to think Todd Bowden was anything but normal. Except, except Betty Trask was the kind of girl who fucked on the first date. On every date, and in between dates. The first time had been a month or so before the goddamn Nazi's heart attack, and Todd thought he had done pretty well for a virgin. Perhaps for the same reason a young pitcher will do well if he's tapped to throw the biggest game of the year with no forewarning. There had been no time to worry to get all strung up about it. Always before Todd had been able to sense when a girl had made up her mind that on the next date she would just allow herself to be carried away, he was aware that he was personable and that both his looks and his prospects were good, the kind of boy their cunty mothers regarded as a good catch. And when he sensed that physical capitulation about to happen, he would start dating some other girl. And whatever it said about his personality, Todd was able to admit to himself that if he ever started dating a truly frigid girl, he would probably be happy to date her for years to come, maybe even marry her. But the first time with Betty had gone fairly well. She was no virgin, even if he was. She had to help him get his cock into her, but she seemed to take that as a matter of course. And halfway through the act itself, she had gurgled up from the blanket they were lying on. I just love to fuck. It was the tone of voice another girl might have used to express her love for strawberry whirl ice cream. Later encounters, there had been five of them, five and a half, he supposed, if he wanted to count last night, hadn't been so good. They had, in fact, gotten worse at what seemed an exponential rate, although he didn't believe even now that Betty had been aware of that. At least not until last night. In fact, quite the opposite. Betty apparently believed she had found the battering ram of her dreams— Todd hadn't felt any of the things he was supposed to feel at a time like that. Kissing her lips was like kissing warm but uncooked liver. Having her tongue in his mouth only made him wonder what kind of germ she was carrying. And sometimes he thought he could smell her fillings, an unpleasant metallic odor like chrome. Her breasts were bags of meat, no more. Todd had done it twice more with her before Dusander's heart attack. Each time he had more trouble getting erect. In both cases, he had finally succeeded by using a fantasy. She was stripped naked in front of all their friends, crying. Todd was forcing her to walk up and down before them while he cried out, Show your tits. Let them see your snatch, you cheap slut. Spread your cheeks. That's right, bend over and spread them. Betty's appreciation was not at all surprising. He was a good lover, not in spite of his problems, but because of them. Getting hard was only the first step. Once you achieved erection, you had to have an orgasm. The fourth time they had done it, this was three days after Dusander's heart attack, he had pounded away at her for over ten minutes. Betty Trask thought she had died and gone to heaven. She had three orgasms and was trying for a fourth when Todd recalled an old fantasy, what was in fact the first fantasy. The girl on the table, clamped and helpless, the huge dildo, the rubber squeeze bulb. Only now, desperate and sweaty and almost insane with his desire to come and get this horror over with, the face of the girl on the table became Betty's face. That brought on a joyless, rubbery spasm that he supposed was technically at least an orgasm. A moment later, Betty was whispering in his ear, her breath warm and redolent of juicy fruit gum. Lover, you do me any old time. Just call me. Todd had nearly groaned aloud. The nub of his dilemma was this. Wouldn't his reputation suffer if he broke off with the girl who so obviously wanted to put out for him? Wouldn't people wonder why? Part of him said they would not. He remembered walking down the hall behind two senior boys during his freshman year and hearing one of them tell the other he had broken off with his girlfriend. The other wanted to know why. Fucked her out, the first said, and both of them bellowed goatish laughter. If someone asks me why I dropped her, I'll just say I fucked her out. But what if she says we only did it five times? Is that enough? What? How much? How many? Who'll talk? What'll they say? So his mind ran on, as restless as a hungry rat in an insoluble maze. He was vaguely aware that he was turning a minor problem into a big problem. 
and that this very inability to solve the problem had something to say about how shaky he had gotten. But knowing it brought him no fresh ability to change his behavior, and he sank into a black depression. College. College was the answer. College offered an excuse to break with Betty that no one could question. But September seemed so far away. The fifth time it had taken him almost twenty minutes to get hard, but Betty had proclaimed the experience well worth the wait, and then last night he hadn't been able to perform at all. What are you, anyway? Betty had asked petulantly. After twenty minutes of manipulating his lax penis, she was disheveled and out of patience. Are you one of those ACDC guys? He very nearly strangled her on the spot. And if he had his thirty-thirty, well, I'll be a son of a gun. Congratulations, son. Huh? He looked up and out of his black study. You made the Southern Cal High School All-Stars. His father was grinning with pride and pleasure. Is that so? For a moment he hardly knew what his father was talking about. He had to grope for the meaning of the words. Oh, say, yeah. Coach Haynes mentioned something to me about that at the end of the year. Said he was putting me and Billy DeLions up. I never expected anything to happen. Well, Jesus, you don't seem very excited about it. I'm still trying, who gives a ripe fuck, to get used to the idea. With a huge effort, he managed to grin. Can I see the article? His father handed the paper across the table to Todd and got to his feet. I'm going to wake Monica up. She's got to see this before we leave. No, oh, God, I can't face both of them this morning. Oh, don't do that. You know she won't be able to get back to sleep if you wake her. We'll leave it for her on the table. Yeah, I suppose we could do that. You're a damn thoughtful boy, Todd. He clapped Todd on the back, and Todd squeezed his eyes closed. At the same time, he shrugged his shoulders in an aw shucks gesture that made his father laugh. Todd opened his eyes again and looked at the paper. Four boys named to Southern Cal All-Stars, the headline read. Beneath were pictures of them in their uniforms. The catcher and left fielder from Fairview High, the harp southpaw from Mountford, and Todd to the far right, grinning openly out at the world from beneath the bill of his baseball cap. He read the story and saw that Billy DeLions had made the second squad. That, at least, was something to feel happy about. DeLions could claim he was a Methodist until his tongue fell out, if it made him feel good, but he wasn't fooling Todd. He knew perfectly well what Billy DeLions was. Maybe he ought to introduce him to Betty Trask. She was another sheeny. He had wondered about that for a long time, and last night he had decided for sure. The Trasks were passing for white. One look at her nose and that olive complexion, her old man's was even worse, and you knew. That was probably why he hadn't been able to get it up. It was simple. His cock had known the difference before his brain. Who did they think they were kidding, calling themselves Trask? Congratulations again, son. He looked up and first saw his father's hand stuck out, then his father's foolishly grinning face. Your buddy Trask is a yid, he heard himself yelling into his father's face. That's why I was impotent with his slut of a daughter last night. That's the reason. Then on the heels of that, the cold voice that sometimes came at moments like this rose up from deep inside him, shutting off the rising flood of irrationality as if, get hold of yourself right now behind steel gates. He took his father's hand and shook it, smiled guilelessly into his father's proud face, said, Geez, thanks, Dad. They left that page of the newspaper folded back and a note for Monica, which Dick insisted Todd write and sign, Your all-star son, Todd.